Hello, this is Rick Weinzerl, and this discussion covers the basics of vegetable insect management. This presentation is part of our program on preparing a new generation of Illinois fruit and vegetable farmers, and this project is funded by a USDA Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program grant. As usual, let's put this in context. There are several previous presentations and discussions on pesticides, OMRI approved pesticides for organic production, and discussions of integrated pest management. We won't repeat all of the content of those, but do keep in mind that all of the things that we covered there on crop rotation, on variety selection, many other topics are important still as we proceed to talk about insect management and vegetables. There are parallel discussions on fruit insect management, weed, disease, and wildlife management. But today what we're going to do is talk about the key insects and related pests of vegetable crops and explain approaches to their management so that you can develop an effective integrated pest management program for your farm. References that we've talked about in conjunction with other discussions uh, there are materials on the course website for Introduction to Applied Entomology at the University of Illinois. Those are publicly available and you can reach them at the links shown in this slide. And just a general good guide to the insects that are present and sometimes damaging in gardens and in fruit and vegetable plantings is the book Garden Insects of North America and the ISBN number is shown here. It's a very good book at a very low price. I believe it sells new for around $30 a copy. So who are the main pests of vegetable crops? This is somewhat an abbreviated list. It's the most important things across a variety of crops. The seed and root maggots, cutworms, flea beetles, all of the worms and cabbage, cucumber beetles and bean leaf beetle, squash bug on squash and pumpkins, potato leaf hopper on a few different crops, Colorado potato beetle, aphids, corn earworm, tomato hornworm, and stink bugs. So those are the ones we'll cover. Others are addressed in the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide and in some of the references that uh, I've listed in the previous slide. So what are the slate of tools for insect management in vegetables? Crop rotation, provide some benefits for some pests. Cover crops help to build natural enemies and soil structure that helps plants survive even where some root damage may be occurring, may help with drainage to prevent some problems. Tillage, time of planting. Resistant varieties are important, although less so for insects than for diseases. Uh, interplanting may favor natural enemies and provide some benefits. Mulching and compost in some cases provide some benefits. Row covers, floating row covers for exclusion are important. Irrigation, uh, not for most insects, but it can be important for uh, minimizing uh, two-spotted spider mite problems in vegetables, uh, but it's overhead irrigation that does that. And overhead irrigation then also favors some disease development. So there are trade-offs. There are many insecticides used in vegetable crops, uh, including organically produced crops. There are natural enemies that provide some degree of control and things you can do to help uh, maintain or enhance their populations. At the small scale, hand removal of uh, insects can be important, although again, that's uh, appropriate, pro appropriate at the small scale, but less so for larger plantings. And culling some damage is important because, in fact, rarely do we produce uh, produce that's entirely without insect damage or contamination. Let's start with the seed and root maggots. There are several of them. We'll talk about three that are most important, and we'll start with cabbage maggot. Cabbage maggot is the larval stage of a fly pupal stage overwinters, and the adults fly and lay eggs early in the spring. They lay eggs in the soil, and the maggots feed on decaying organic matter, and then on the roots of cabbage family crops. 
They're most common where planting or transplanting is done into cool or wet soils and where organic matter is high. Another common seed and root maggot is seed corn maggot. Its life cycle is quite similar to the cabbage maggot. It's most damaging to early planted corn, beans, crucifers, cucurbits, and again mostly during cool wet weather and soils with high organic matter. There are several generations of this insect per year, but only the first one is the one that's important for damaging seedlings. The eggs hatch in two to three days, larvae complete development in seven to ten days, and once you see damaged plants, there's really nothing you can do to rescue that crop. Uh, all you can do is replant, because once you let this insect run its course in first generation, you can plant into the same spot again without further damage. And the third of these that we'll cover is onion maggot. It has a life cycle similar to cabbage maggot and seed corn maggot. And this one can actually cause damage through the season, later generations as well as the first generation damage onions, especially where you see sequential plantings. Um, you see basically the kind of damage you would see in an onion bulb. And interestingly, all of these insects are subject to infection by a fungal pathogen that kills them. So sometimes you'll see them hanging on the tops of onions or grasses uh, with spores coming out of their bodies where they've been infected and killed uh, by a fungal pathogen. So what do you do to avoid damage from seed and root maggots? First realize that onion maggot indeed is pretty much restricted to onions. Cabbage maggot is pretty much restricted to cabbage family plants. But seed corn maggot will actually go to virtually all vegetable crops. So sometimes you will see seed corn maggot in onions or garlic, and you'll see seed corn maggot on the uh, roots of cabbage or cabbage family crops. In general, you always destroy crop residues and in the case of onions, you remove and destroy cull onions. And the purpose for this is to prevent continued reproduction on those crops. You plant on well-drained soils if possible, and organic matter attracts the egg-laying flies. So lots of organic matter, while good in many ways, can actually attract more problems. So if you're planting after a cover crop, it's good to incorporate it at least three weeks before planting or transplanting into that soil. What happens there is the flies that lay eggs do so. The larvae develop within the uh, feeding on the incorporated cover crop. But they actually mature and move on before you plant a vegetable crop that's vulnerable to them. If you plant when soils have warmed to 70 degrees, uh, it speeds development of uh, seeds and transplants so that they escape damage. They simply outgrow a, a minor infestation. And floating row covers can work if eggs are not already deposited in high organic matter soils before you put the row covers on. So that can be an issue. Uh, soil insecticides or seed treatment insecticides are listed in the uh, Midwest Vegetable Production Guide and there are different insecticides that can be used in different vegetable crops. Cutworms are important early season and sometimes late season pests as well. Black cutworm is an insect that migrates in from the south each season. This one comes very early in the spring, in March and April in many cases. Other species uh, will damage corn, green beans, tomatoes, other vegetable crops, just as black cutworm does. Some of them actually overwinter here as eggs or larvae in the soil. One we talk about a lot is black cutworm, but there are others as well. Black cutworms, as they migrate into the region, prefer to lay eggs in weedy fields, and for that matter, weedy gardens, for egg laying. So cover crops and weeds can actually attract the egg laying moths. Um, some of them cut plants at the ground level, as you see for the picture of black cutworm in the middle on the right. Others, as we go through the season, will feed on the fruits of tomatoes or peppers, or as you see in the lower left, they'll feed on the bulbs of radishes. So the kind of damage they do differs depending on the time of year that they are present. Some of the worms that feed on uh, ripening tomatoes and peppers are 
cutworms that early in the season would cut plants or feed on foliage. So what can be done for cutworm management? Many of you are familiar with the small-scale approaches to this where you somehow put a barrier around a plant to keep cutworms from cutting it. So the aluminum foil or the cup that you see in the picture here are good examples at the small scale. Obviously this is not practical as we go to larger scale commercial production. So what can you do there? Well, fall and spring tillage, uh, remove some of the plants that attract egg laying moths. They also help to uh, encourage decay of plant debris so that by the time you reach planting in the spring, you no longer have the organic matter at high levels that's attracting egg-laying moths. Weed control is important in the same way. Again, weeds attract egg-laying moths. There are a number of insecticides that are used for the general use products. Carbaryl provides some control. And pyrethroids, most of which are restricted use products, are used commonly to control the larval feeding either on small plants where they cut the plants or where we're looking at foliage and fruit feeding later in the season. Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt and Entrust, both of which are approved for use in organic production, can be used against the foliage feeding species and they do a pretty good job of controlling them. Next, flea beetles. I think everybody has seen these. They are very small beetles with hind legs that are adapted for jumping, like fleas, so they're called flea beetles. They are also, however, capable of flight and they do move at least moderate distances across the landscape. There are several different species that feed on cabbage and related plants, different ones on tomatoes, potatoes, and eggplants, and yet a different one on sweet corn. So there are different flea beetles on different families of crops. The adults survive the winter and they move to crops soon after they emerge from seeds or are transplanted. So they find the crop relatively quickly in the spring of the year. In most crops, flea beetle control is necessary where numbers are high enough that their feeding stresses seedlings and slows their growth. In the case of leafy greens, uh, flea beetle control is warranted when the beetles are causing enough damage to foliage by eating holes in the leaves that the foliage is just not marketable. So either of those might be a threshold or a trigger for applying an insecticide to control them. The flea beetles on crucifers are often the greatest in weedy fields and they're the greatest on smoother glossy leaved varieties of different uh, cabbage family crops. You can intercrop with tomatoes to provide a little bit of hiding of the crop. Uh, you can till in residues immediately after harvest in order to prevent more flea beetles from feeding on the remaining plant material above ground. And yes, you can use row covers early on to keep beetles from reaching sensitive crops. <coughs> Effective insecticides include carbaryl or 7, a number of pyrethroids, and the pyrethrins plus diatomaceous earth or cryocyte or cryolite are sometimes used by organic growers to uh, reduce numbers of flea beetles. Flea beetles on potatoes and the fruiting vegetables such as tomato and pepper and eggplant are generally the same beetles across those crops. Uh, potato flea beetle, pale stripe flea beetle, and some others are among the, the flea beetles on these crops. Again, the adults overwinter, they move to the crop uh, early in the spring, and because we are not harvesting the foliage of these crops, generally we say if there's not more than about 30 percent of the leaf area removed, or more than four beetles per plant when the seedlings are small, you don't need to control them. It is always important to watch eggplant because flea beetle numbers build up uh, very quickly on eggplant and they can cause pretty severe damage to foliage. And the controls, the insecticides, the row covers, quite similar to the things we've listed for the cabbage family plants earlier. And of course as soon as any of these crops begin to bloom 
You have to get the row covers off in order to let uh, pollinators reach the blossoms. One interesting flea beetle in the group is corn flea beetle. Again, the adults overwinter. This one is important because it picks up a bacterial pathogen in the fall of the year called the Stewart's wilt bacterium. And then it transmits that pathogen to seedling corn plants and small corn plants in the spring of the year. In fact, through the season. And although most of the, almost all of the commercial hybrid dent corn, the field corn in Illinois, is resistant to Stewart's wilt, there are some early season, quick maturing sweet corn hybrids that are not Stewart's wilt resistant. If you're an organic grower, you really need to use a Stewart's, res Stewart's wilt resistant hybrid. Um, otherwise, it's still a good idea, but if you do need to plant something that's not resistant to Stewart's wilt, which the flea beetle carries, then the threshold is six beetles per hundred plants when uh, the, the corn is less than the five leaf stage, and there are a number of insecticides that work. Rotenone, by the way, is still used by some non-certified organic growers, but it is not uh, allowed in certified organic production. Flea beetles, corn flea beetles, and Stewart's wilt are actually less prevalent than they were a few years ago, and it's the result primarily of the widespread use of seed treatments on field corn that have just greatly reduced the overall populations of corn flea beetles throughout the Midwest. That's not all good because those insecticides are also ones linked to uh, bee kill. But in fact, uh, you should know that the numbers of corn flea beetles are down compared to historic averages over the years. Let's move to some of the common pests of the plants in the cabbage family. And among them are several worms, or Lepidopteran larvae, that feed on foliage and heads of cabbage family crops. They're often called leps because they, again, are the larval stage of butterflies and moths in the order Lepidoptera. One of them is imported cabbage worm. The adult is the white cabbage butterfly. The larva is a bright green velvety uh, worm or larva that feeds on leaves and in the heads. And when it pupates, it forms a naked chrysalis rather than a pupa within a cocoon. Remember, that's what butterflies do compared to moths as they move from the larval stage through pupation to become adults. Imported cabbage worm overwinters here in the pupal stage in that chrysalis, and adults are active early in the season. They are the day-flying white butterflies. The larvae are velvety green, again about an inch long when fully grown, and it takes about four to five weeks to complete development from egg to adult laying new eggs. And there are four to five generations per year in much of the Midwest, including Illinois. This is the easiest of the three major LEPs to kill with insecticides. And BT and Spinosad, or Entrust, are very effective, not just for organic growers, but also for conventional growers. A second worm in cabbage is the larva of diamondback moth. And you see the small moth on the left with a bit of a diamond sequence pattern uh, along the back with its wings folded together. And the small larva, sort of yellow-green, on the right side that feeds partly through foliage to begin with, uh, feeding uh, not necessarily even through the opposite epidermis. If it starts on the top or the bottom, it may not go through the entire leaf. It overwinters as an adult in protected areas, and its overwintering success is not great here, but there is some in most seasons. Uh, larvae and pupae are also brought in on transplants, and in cases where they are resistant to insecticides in the areas where the transplants are grown, then the insects we receive on those transplants may be resistant to certain insecticides as well. The larvae are small. They're only about 3 8 inch long when fully grown. Their generation time is quite short, three to four weeks, and there will be four to six generations per year. Oftentimes the first one is on mustard family weeds uh, in fields and in adjacent areas. 
This is a species that uh, is characterized by populations in different parts of the world with severe insecticide resistance uh, traits, and it can sometimes be very hard to control. And the third of the insects, the LEP larvae that we see on cabbage family plants is cabbage looper. It's a brown moth, uh, night flying, uh, sort of a dark brown grayish moth with a certain pattern on its wings. Uh, the larvae are large caterpillars and they move in this looping fashion that you see in the picture on the right, or an inchworm fashion. Cabbage looper does not winter very successfully in the Midwest. In some instances, adults in protected areas, vegetation next to a house where uh, temperatures may be warm enough, may provide for some successful overwintering, but in general, adults migrate in from the south on weather systems each year. Full-grown larvae are an inch and a half long. They have only three pairs of the hook-like uh, abdominal prolegs, so it moves in that inchworm or looping fashion is called a looper. Generation time is about four to six weeks from eggs of one generation to eggs of the next. And so there are three or four generations per year in much of the Midwest. As larvae get larger, grow bigger, they are very difficult to control. They're not very susceptible to Bt as they get past the first couple of young stages. So the pyrethroids are best where some cleanup is necessary in cabbage or broccoli uh, before you harvest the crop and take the head to market. Um, Spinoset or in trust is probably the more effective alternative for organic growers instead of Bt. There are some established thresholds or infestation levels that should trigger control for these LEPs and commercial plantings of cabbage family crops. They differ in broccoli and cauliflower from cabbage. Uh, in general, if you do seed bed or greenhouse production of transplants, if you find one of any of these worms on 10% uh, of the plants in a seed bed, uh, then we generally would recommend control. From transplant to heading, uh, you, can, you can accept a greater number of worms on plants. And the reason you don't treat as soon is because you allow some natural enemies to build up that will help control them as the season goes on. Then when you get to cupping in cabbage or heading to harvest in all of these crops, then again you go back to much lower thresholds because you don't want contamination in the crop at harvest when you take it to market. So the percentages refer to the portion of plants with any larvae of cabbage looper, diamondback moth, or imported cabbage worm, and you determine that by checking five to ten plants in each of five to ten areas uh, once or twice weekly. And then when you move to things like the crucifer family greens, uh, the thresholds for heading to harvest are often used uh, pretty much throughout the production of the greens because you're worried again about the damage caused to the leaf that you're selling and whether or not consumers will buy uh, greens that have large areas of leaf tissue removed by insect feeding. To control these insects in the cabbage family crops, you can put floating row covers that it onto the crop immediately after uh, planting or transplanting, or at least after they come out of the ground. And the idea there is you are keeping moths from laying eggs on the crops. Most of the time we recommend that everybody use Bt products uh, early on for control of worms in any planting because the Bt will kill most of the pests, but also will leave alive the natural enemies that might attack and kill the the worms that escape the spray. And you see parasitic wasps in the, or a parasitic wasp in the result of its attacking a larva of an imported cabbage worm up in the upper right. Spinosad is an effective alternative, although it will kill some natural enemies as well. And pyrethroids are very effective if used only sparingly. So typically we would say use Bt and Spinosad and other selective products early in the, 
the development of a crop and use a pyrethroid only once or twice as the crop is close to harvest and you need to make sure the heads are worm free. Let's go to some insects that everybody is quite familiar with, striped and spotted cucumber beetles. These insects winter as adults and like the corn flea beetle that we talked about with Stewart's Wild of Sweet Corn, the cucumber beetles feed on plants that are infected with bacterial wilt in late summer and fall and they carry that bacterial pathogen in their gut through the winter. Then they'll feed on seedlings or transplants in the spring and they transmit the bacteria and it causes bacterial wilt. Bacterial wilt is most damaging to cucumbers and muskmelons. Some squash varieties will show some signs of wilt but primarily you're worried about bacterial wilt in cucumbers and muskmelons and it is carried by striped and spotted cucumber beetles. There are one to two generations per year depending on your latitude in the state of Illinois. The larvae feed on the roots of uh, cucurbits and of corn but they really are not damaging as root feeding insects. They're generally, uh, the beetles are generally controlled by the use of insecticides on plants, by floating row covers early on, and trap crops can help. Uh, the trap crops might be zucchini, they might be something else. Uh, they do not provide complete control and if bacterial wilt is an issue on cucumbers and melons, the trap crops will not prevent that from happening. So there are thresholds for management of this insect on cucumbers and melons. Uh, you, you, the going threshold is one beetle per plant or fewer if in fact wilt was severe in an, in an adjacent field the year before. In watermelon and squash, because bacterial wilt is not such an issue, five beetles per plant is often used as an insecticide. What can you do to control it? Well, think first of the things that help to prevent infestations. You destroy or till in crops immediately after harvest so that you do not continue to feed beetles and allow them to uh, build up reserves to lay more eggs the following year or later in that season. Uh, row covers over plants early in the season will keep them off as long as they are removed for pollination. The insecticides most commonly used are pyrethroids or carbaryl. Uh, pyrethrins are used by organic growers and they'll do some good as well. But you spray when bees are not active and in all cases you always use liquid formulations of these products rather than wettable powders or dusts because the bees will in fact pick up the particles from wettable powders or dusts and carry them back to hives. So if you spray the liquid formulations when bees are not active then the problems with bee kill are greatly reduced or avoided. Do realize that there is an insect that looks quite a bit like striped cucumber beetle that is very, very abundant in late season in Illinois, and it's the western corn rootworm, or the adult of the larvae that are called western corn rootworms. Striped cucumber beetles, the picture of one is on the left, have stripes that are very distinct, and they run the full length of the shell-like forewing that covers the body. So it goes all the way from right behind the head to the tip of the wing. They feed on leaves, stems, and fruits of a number of cucurbit crops. And these are the ones that carry bacteria uh, that cause bacterial wilt. And they arrive in April and May. There may be another generation later. If you turn these beetles over, the underside of the abdomen is black. Contrast that with western corn rootworm beetles. This picture on the right. Uh, the stripes are blurry, they're short, they don't go all the way to the end of the shell-like forewings that cover the abdomen. And if you turn this beetle over and you look at its abdomen, it's yellow to tan or light brown. They feed primarily on pollen, although they will in fact do some damage to, say for example, mature pumpkins. They do not transmit bacterial wilt and they typically show up first uh, sometime in July. Another beetle that's quite common and feeds on the foliage of a number of crops, especially beans, is bean leaf beetle. These winter as adults and the larvae feed on the roots of legumes as uh, they pass through two generations per year in the Midwest. 
The adults will feed on lots of garden crops. They are especially a pest on beans. Um, you control them with the same kind of insecticides that might be used for cucumber beetles. And again, you can keep them off of plants early in the season by using floating row covers. Everybody's favorite among vegetable insects, squash bug. Uh, squash bug adults overwinter as adults. They become active sort of early to midsummer, later than a number of other insects become active as we move into the season. They'll lay eggs on the leaves of cucurbit family plants, particularly squash and pumpkins. They really are not pests on cucumbers or melons. And you see the eggs in the upper left picture. Uh, those hatch to form grayish whitish nymphs that turn darker as they develop through successive stages. They feed by sticking their feeding stylet or beak into plants and sucking out juices and it is the removal of plant fluids that's the main damage that they cause. You can make control decisions for squash bug based on the number that are present in a planting. So you count the egg masses, not the nymphs or adults, but the egg masses. And the threshold is 1 to 1.5 egg masses per plant. You look for the egg masses to make a decision to spray or not, but you time the sprays to target the newly hatched nymphs because they are most susceptible. For Conventional growers, pyrethroids, particularly Brigade and Warrior and Mustang Max and their generics, are the most effective. Uh, for organic growers, there really are no good squash bug control products. So what are the cultural controls you can use for squash bug management? As we talked about for other pests, destroy the crop residue as soon as harvest is done. Don't leave the plants and the fruit there. Either pick it and compost it effectively or till the plant material so that it's incorporated in the soil and decays. Because if you leave plant material there for the bugs to feed on, you allow them to successfully reach the adult stage and be the creatures that will reproduce the following season. Row covers used early can keep squash bugs off plants. And at the small scale again, uh, destroying the eggs on leaves can work for even up to uh, 100 or 200 plants in a, in a small plot. An insect that often goes unnoticed in Illinois vegetable and fruit crops is potato leafhopper. You see the adult and the nymphal stage in the upper right. This insect migrates into Illinois each summer, often sometime in late May or early June, and the adults and nymphs feed on a variety of plants. And as they feed, they stick a feeding stylet or beak into the plant, and they secrete or inject a little bit of saliva that contains a toxin, and it causes distorted growth of leaves from that point up. And it's called hopper burn. And you see the symptoms on beans and on potatoes in the pictures at the right. There are thresholds for controlling these. In seedling green beans, it's two leaf hoppers per foot of row. As they get to third leaf, it's five per foot of row. And there are some thresholds in potatoes as well. Often we treat potatoes if leaf hoppers are present at more than just a trace level. You can use row covers in beans to keep them off the crop early. And they're not hard to control. Carboril and pyrethroids work fine in green beans. Pyrethrins work for organic growers, but you can get reinfestation. So it's always important to continue looking at these crops as they develop through susceptible stages. Colorado potato beetle is another devastating pest of crops in the nightshade family, especially potatoes. It overwinters as adults in the soil. They come out of the soil in the spring of the year and lay eggs on leaves. And you see an egg mass in the picture in the lower right. The larvae and the adults will feed on leaves, and there are two generations per year. This insect is sort of the poster child or poster insect uh, that exemplifies insecticide resistance in entomology because it's resistant to a number of different insecticides or populations of it are in different parts of the world. And 
knowing which insecticides work and don't is really important because uh, if you spray one product and it does not work, repeating a spray with the same product is not likely to be successful because more than likely the insect is resistant or the population you have is resistant to that insecticide. So what can you do? Yes, you can use row covers early. Um, crop rotation is actually quite important for this insect because it does move from one location to another, but it doesn't move well. So if you rotate crops, and the beetles come out of the ground and they have to move a long distance to find more potatoes, you can uh, avoid infestations or at least heavy infestations. At the small scale, hand destruction of eggs and adults and larvae is possible. You can trench along the edges of plantings or even flame small plants to kill the beetles without killing the plants. There is a Bt product that is effective against the larvae of Colorado potato beetles. It's not the standard set of Bt products, uh, but Bt tenebrianus does work and there are products uh, sold for Colorado potato beetle control that organic growers can use that contain this ingredient. Seven or the pyrethroids uh, are used for Colorado potato beetle control. Uh, some of the common ones include permethrin and cyfluthrin and esfenvalerate. But in fact, if you look in the Midwest uh, Vegetable Production Guide, you'll find several different pyrethroids that work against Colorado potato beetle. And oddly, the spinosads, such as in trust, uh, are effective against this insect. Another group of insects that provides lots of problems for vegetable growers are the aphids. This is an entire family of different species, and there are many. They're about a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch long when fully mature. They may be winged or wingless as adults. They're all wingless or developing wings if they're going to as immatures. They have pear-shaped bodies and many species have little projections out the back end of the body called cornicles that look a bit like tailpipes. Their colors may vary greatly and in fact identifying species of aphids except for a few is quite difficult. In all cases adult females of aphids give birth to live young. In some portions of their life cycle they may also lay eggs, but throughout most of the season adult females give birth to live young who are all female as well, and so the reproductive potential is phenomenal. They have lots of natural enemies. The picture in the left shows a parasitic wasp, and the two below show insects or aphids that are called mummies or swollen shells of themselves that have been killed by parasitic wasps. Uh, mummies of similar appearance develop when a fungal disease kills aphids. And you see uh, feeding by a surfid fly larva at the very bottom in the center. Lady beetles also are very common predators of aphids. There are many year-round resident species of aphids in different parts of the country that have separate winter and summer hosts. The examples we think about rosy apple aphid in apples overwinters as eggs on the apples. Uh, there's a couple of generations develop on apples in the spring of the year and then it moves to its summer host which is narrow leaf plantain. Develops several generations there then moves back to apples to lay eggs. The only egg laying that occurs is on apples in the fall of the year. Something similar happens with soybean aphids. They overwinter as eggs on common buckthorn. They undergo a few generations of development on buckthorn, then migrate to move across the landscape to find soybeans, and that is their summer host. In the fall of the year they move back to common buckthorn. There is a sexual generation that lays eggs, and the eggs then overwinter. That is one kind of life cycle for aphids, but there are a number of them that do not overwinter here on a host where they lay eggs, but instead they migrate into the region over great distances. Corn leaf aphid does that every year. Cotton melon aphid of cucurbits does that. Turnip aphid may do that. No matter how they overwinter or get here, the real thing about aphids is their rapid population growth. 
they undergo parthenogenesis, or reproduction without males, where females give birth to live young, all of which are female, and in a very few days those females are adults and they start giving birth to live young as well. And so populations increase very, very rapidly. Aphids are pests on plants because they may directly impact growth. You see that with a picture of cabbage aphid or turnip aphid damage to cabbage in the top picture. They may contaminate crops by their presence or the presence of this sticky stuff that they secrete as they feed, and it's called honeydew. So you see the sweet corn ear with aphids and honeydew on the right. A little tougher to sell at the farmer's market than an uninfested ear. And they transmit plant pathogens, particularly viruses. And viruses reduce yield and quality in a number of crops. There are few thresholds for aphid infestations on crops. There are a few, and they're listed in the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for certain crops. But in general, infestations may be sort of localized, meaning high numbers in one place, not many in another spot. So you'll look for those infestations. And you also look to see if there are natural enemies there. So little wasps and what you might see is their product, the mummies that have little holes in them where a wasp has laid an egg and the wasp larva has developed inside, uh, turned into an adult and crawled out. So that's one sign of the presence of natural enemies. Lady beetles, adults and larvae, and surfid flies, hoverflies, and the little larvae that feed on aphids. All of those are natural enemies. So you look for infestations, look for natural enemies, describe it a little bit to yourself. Do I have colonies on most of the leaves or just a few? Do I see natural enemies or not? And put a flag in that area and then check it again in a few days to see if the infestation is increasing or if natural enemies are keeping it under control. And if not, then you may choose to use an insecticide that's effective against aphids. So what do you do for management? Well, one is to try to conserve those natural enemies by spraying only when you need to for other pests. Oftentimes we see pumpkin growers who will need to spray fungicides to prevent certain diseases in pumpkins as we go through the summer. And they may choose to add a pyrethroid to the spray tank just because it might provide some benefit. Often what it does is it kills the natural enemies of aphids so that they build up. And you see aphids on the underside of the leaf in the picture on the left. And as they build up, they secrete honeydew. And in the case of pumpkins, you get this uh, sticky coated pumpkin and some fungal growth starts to show up on it. And that problem is usually greatest where there are too many sprays of seven or pyrethroids during the summertime. There are specific products for aphid control and they are listed by crop in the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide. But one thing you want to remember is that it's really not possible to prevent virus problems in cucurbit crops by spraying insecticides to kill aphids. And the reason is that they transmit viruses too soon before you kill them. And really the way to manage virus problems is to use multiple planting sites to plant as early as possible and to use resistant varieties where they are available resistant to the virus diseases. So why is it that we really can't control viruses by controlling aphids in a field of vegetables? Well, except for potato leaf roll virus, which is a problem in the production of seed potatoes, the common viruses transmitted by aphids to vegetable crops in the Midwest are transmitted in what's called a non-persistent manner. That means the aphids pick up the virus, transmit it, and after a few feeding probes, no longer transmit it. This is true for cucumber mosaic virus, watermelon mosaic virus, zucchini yellows mosaic virus, and many others. They're transmitted by such aphids as bean aphid, cotton melon aphid, soybean aphid, and the other species listed here. And many of those aphids may not even colonize a vegetable crop as they pass through. Instead, they feed on an infected weed, often weeds in the nightshade family, for example, but an infected weed. 
Uh, they acquire the virus in just a short feeding episode. They move downwind across a crop field and feed, uh, trying to decide if that's the crop they will infest or not. And after just a few seconds, they have transmitted the virus. As they continue to move, the virus retention in the aphid vector is very short. So after it's fed two or three times, it really no longer carries the virus. And it takes that long before the insecticides kill the vector. So in fact, what we do is we kill the vector after it has transmitted the virus, and that really does not prevent the disease problem in fields. Let's go to another common insect, uh, corn earworm or tomato fruit worm. And this is a case where a single species of insect is known by two common names. The larvae feed on the fruits of many crops, including corn and peppers and tomatoes and green beans. And you see pictures of the adults and the larva moving into a tomato plant uh, at the right. This is the kind of damage you see from tomato fruit worm, injury to tomatoes. The larvae will feed at the surface and then actually uh, tunnel right into the fruit, as you see in these photos. Tomato fruit worm or corn earworm, regardless of which name we use, does not overwinter in much of Illinois. There are overwintering populations along the river uh, just east of St. Louis and perhaps sometimes in uh, the area along the Illinois River in uh, Tazewell or Peoria counties. But for the most part, our corn earworm populations migrate in each year from the south. We've talked about this for other insects. So for just for a second, uh, let's explain what that looks like. If you think of what happens when weather systems set up in various locations of the country, when we see a high pressure system to the southeast, it's generating clockwise winds. A low pressure system to the west is generating counterclockwise winds. So as we look at the area from Louisiana and Texas up through Arkansas, Missouri, and Illinois, the winds from both of those weather systems are strong and from the south and southwest. As insects move up into the thermals, they are carried along those winds until the winds reach a frontal boundary. And at the frontal boundary, it may rain, but it also triggers the insects to drop out from the weather system, from the upper level winds. That's how corn earworm gets here each year. And that migration comes at different times in different seasons. Sometimes we have a significant migration that produces lots of moths in central Illinois and elsewhere in the state as early as mid-June. In other years, we don't see that until mid-August. So although there is some overwintering in a few areas, the fact that populations result primarily from migration means that the only way we know when they arrive is to use a pheromone trap to detect the migration in the presence of moths. The trap we use for corn earworms looks a lot different than the little paper traps we use for fruit insects and orchards. And the reason is that as corn earworms near a pheromone lure, the males tend to fly upwards in a spiral pattern. So the typical trap for corn earworm is this heart stack or wire cone trap that you see in the picture at the left. You bait it with a lure for corn earworm males, so it's the a synthetic version of the female's sex pheromone. That lure is placed at the center of the bottom or the large cone. And as males come to it, they then fly upwards and they're caught in the cylinder above the top funnel of that cone. And in general, if you're catching more than five to 10 traps per night, or even fewer if there's no other corn around that's silking or no corn around that's silking, you would expect to see significant egg laying in sweet corn and in tomatoes. And that means you'd need to use insecticides or otherwise try to control the larvae that will infest sweet corn ears or tomato fruits. What insecticides are used for tomato fruit worm? 
pyrethroids are used. There are some problems with resistance in tomato fruitworm, corn earworm to pyrethroids. Seven is used in backyard gardens and by several small commercial growers. Spinosads, including in trust for organic growers, could be used in tomatoes and sweet corn. And in tomatoes, Bt products like Dipel, the, the caterpillar Bt products, work fine. They work in tomatoes because larvae feed on treated surfaces before they enter the tomato. In sweet corn, they don't work because larvae tunnel down the silk channel and then start feeding, and you can't spray a Bt product into that silk channel. And yes, there are some hand applicators that people use to put Bt into each silk channel. Those are pretty labor intensive. So if we were to switch, as I guess I've already started, to this insect's role in sweet corn, we then call it corn earworm. And in corn earworm, the female moths lay eggs on silks. So the lower left picture uh, shows you a, an egg on an individual corn silk. So you have an idea of the size. We would know moths are flying and egg laying is going on because we're catching males in traps. If you look at the male in the upper left picture, it's typically what you see when you find corn earworm males in traps. And that brown spot beside or behind the head is not natural. It's because the moth was in the trap and flapping up against the side of the trap and it brushes the scales off that spot. So if you see that, it's not diagnostic, but it's quite common for insects and traps. The larvae move down the silk channel, feed on the tips of ears, and you see these large larvae at the tips of ears. I can't go through a detailed discussion of spray timing and rationale for corn earworm control in sweet corn, but a recent issue of the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable News covered that in quite a bit of detail, and that uh, the link to that presentation or that discussion is presented here in this slide. So take a look at that to get uh, all of the details about corn earworm control in sweet corn. Another common insect, if we sort of go back to tomatoes, we had tomato fruit worm, is of course tomato hornworm. And I think many of you have seen this insect. Uh, the adult is a large hawk moth or sphinged or sphinx moth, you see in the lower right, uh, lays eggs. The larvae reach quite a big size. Uh, you can tell in the picture in the upper left, they're often the size of a person, an adult's index finger. Uh, they drop to the ground to pupate and the pupa is uh, quite large as well. You see it in the lower left and you actually see the proboscis, the feeding mouth parts, uh, sort of open from the rest of the head. Looks almost like the handle of a pitcher when you see these uh, pupae in the soil. The larvae feed on the outside of fruits. They also feed on uh, leaves and petioles and will strip stems bare as they feed on the foliage. And the damage to fruit is, is quite extensive. When you see something that looks like the picture in the lower right, those are not the eggs of a parasitic insect, those are the cocoons. A single uh, braconid wasp has come along and laid an egg or two eggs into a small hornworm larva. The hornworm continues to feed and grow and the egg or two inside the larva before they hatch to form parasitic wasp larvae actually undergo what is called polyembryony. It means lots of embryos from a single egg. It's sort of like twinning, but taken to extremes. So instead of two twins or quadruplets or octuplets, we might have 64 uplets or whatever word might be used for that to explain what happens to produce multiple larvae inside that hornworm. They feed, they don't kill it until they are almost completely grown. Then in fact, they crawl out of the worm, spin a silken cocoon, and a small wasp will emerge from each of those tiny white cocoons. So when you see this, don't uh, destroy it. 
leave it there because that's going to produce lots of wasps that will help in the natural control of this insect in the future. So to summarize, uh, tomato hornworm pupae pass the winter. They turn into adults in late spring and early summer. And there's just one generation a year. The threshold that triggers sprays should be one half to one larvae per plant. But the trick is not to wait until that one larva is three and a half inches long and has done lots of feeding. So scout repeatedly in tomatoes and when you find small larvae make spray decisions then. Parasites do limit populations in many cases. If you choose to spray Bt products, those would kill the hornworms, but not kill the parasitic wasps directly anyway, that would then attack the hornworms that escape your spray. Spinoset is effective, so are pyrethroids. They are more detrimental to natural enemies and pollinators. Let's look at stink bugs and plant bugs. You have a brown stink bug on the left, green stink bug uh, to the lower right, and a tarnished plant bug uh, in the upper right. Let's uh, remember there are lots and lots of different stink bugs in the landscape. There are over 45 stink bug species uh, that occur commonly in North America, and I have pictured just a few of them here. Um, and these are all just the brown ones, and they're often cited pests of a variety of crops, including several vegetables. There are a couple of different green stink bugs here. Uh, southern green stink bug does not spread through the whole state most years, uh, but you see the adult and a nymph in the upper pictures. And the lower picture is just plain green stink bug, Acrosternum. And you see the adults, or the adult and a nymph. There are lots of different plant bugs, and they're called that because it's the the common name of a family of uh, hemipteran insects of true bugs. So plant bugs. There are dozens of common species. Ligus bug is in the upper left and a different one in the uh, lower picture. And there's a nice summary of uh, plant bugs in the Midwest at the website uh, listed at the bottom of the page. Stink bugs and plant bugs insert their stylet into tissue. So their beak or their feeding stylet, they suck out juice and they kill cells around it. So what you'll see from stink bug damage to tomatoes and peppers is yellow or white quirky pithy areas beneath the skin. Um, the brown and stink bug, brown and green stink bugs uh, feed on tomatoes and peppers, but they also show up on lots of other crops. And one thing that you'll see for both of these groups of stink bugs is that as soybeans start to dry down in the late summer and early fall, the stink bugs move to crops that are still green, and that might be your tomatoes or peppers. You may not see them real obviously on plants because as you move up or you disturb the plants, they drop to the ground and hide. So sometimes you want to use a beating sheet or a flat tray underneath plants and shake plants to dislodge them and see what falls on the tray. And detecting them early before they've caused a lot of the damage you see in these pictures is important because once they've caused the feeding damage, controlling these bugs will not uh, do anything to uh, repair the damage in those fruits. They aren't easy to control. Pyrethroids are most effective. And there are really not a lot of good products for organic growers for stink bug control. Remember that these insects feed on flower buds, fruits, and seeds. And one of the things that triggers their, or that attracts them, is a lot of blooming plants. So reducing the presence of blooming weeds and vegetable plantings is really pretty important because it can reduce the movement of stink bugs into those plantings. So overall, what are the kinds of things you can do for insect management and vegetables? Well, tillage does help. It uh, reduces the number of cutworms and armyworms that may lay eggs and crops. Delaying planting may avoid some of the seed and root maggots. <laughs> Unfortunately, earlier planting helps to avoid some of the things like corn earworm and stink bugs. 
In fact, though, for most vegetable growers, you are making early plantings and late plantings all of the time. And what's important is that you understand some insects will be more common in the early ones than the late ones and vice versa. Diversity of plantings is always a helpful thing. There are some cases where diversity actually attracts some additional pests or some different pests, but the diversity of crops, the diversity of landscapes, and the stability of keeping some kind of ground cover in place at all times, so cover crops, for example, is important. Those overall help to reduce numbers and problems with insect pests of vegetables. Most of the time, good weed control is a plus not a detractor from insect management. Uh, some weeds do harbor natural enemies. Overall, weed control is usually viewed as something that helps with insect management. And of course, you can use floating row covers for exclusion. Those are all good cultural controls. If you think about what insecticides might be used by small-scale vegetable growers, seven or carbaryl is effective against many beetles and caterpillars and liquid formulations such as 7XLR plus are, like less are less likely to kill bees. 7 is not effective against aphids, squash bug, or mites, and never use the wettable powder formulations because they're especially toxic to bees. Pyrethroids are generally effective against a lot of beetles, caterpillars, squash bug, stink bugs, leaf hoppers. Most of them are highly toxic to bees, but they can be used without uh, damaging bee colonies by spraying when bees are not active and using liquid formulations. Pyrethroids are generally not effective against aphids or mites and you end up going to the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide to look for specific products for aphid or mite control. Malathion, still widely used by some small-scale growers, uh, does provide some aphid control, a little bit effective against some beetles, um, but these are the common things that are used quite a bit. And then there are many specialty products that are selective for control of certain pests. And the Veg Production Guide provides a list of those. For organic growers, the BT Kurstaki products are the ones that are effective against caterpillars. BT Tenebrianus is effective against Colorado potato beetle larvae. Neem oils can be somewhat effective against aphids. Pyrethrins are generally used against small beetles. Uh, they do not last very long. And the ones that are combined with piperonal butoxide as a synergist are not approved for certified organic production. So although they're a bit more effective, uh, they don't fit into a certified organic uh, farm. Kaolin or surround is a water dispersible clay. It has some value against beetles. It's a little tough to apply in handheld sprayers because it requires constant agitation. It's a very coarse uh, powdery product that you'll use at quite a high rate uh, because it forms a physical barrier on leaves. Soaps such as Impede or Safer's insecticidal soap are effective against aphids and mites and leafhopper nymphs that the sprays contact directly, but they have no residual activity. And Trust is a microbial product that's effective against caterpillars, uh, thrips, and a few other specific pests. And then diatomaceous earth and the cryolite and cryocide products are abrasive. Um, they have a mixed range of things they work against. Um, they are not quite as effective as most label claims might suggest. As I did with the fruit uh, insect management discussion, I'll refer you to some good references on natural enemies, both predators and parasites, and on pollinators. Uh, there is a YouTube video that's quite uh, informative, as well as a flyer on natural enemies listed in the first two links, and then some information on plants that enhance natural enemy abundance or pollinators, and those links are provided here. Always read the newsletters that help keep you up to date. Uh, three that are quite helpful for Midwest growers are the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable News, uh, Purdue's uh, Vegetable Crops Hotline, 
and the Ohio Vegetable and Fruit Newsletter, and the links to those are presented here. And I've referred repeatedly to the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for commercial growers. This contains lots of listings of insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, as well as some cultural practices for pest management and some general guides for production. So that's a, a reference that pretty much everybody should have, and the link to the online version of it is presented here. Finally, if you need to contact me, my email address is listed in this slide. Uh, please feel free to send me a message to ask questions or ask for clarification or even report some of your observations on what has worked and has not worked for you. So thank you. Uh, that's it for a discussion of vegetable insect management. There is a lot more we could talk about and we'll use some of our class discussion time to do that.